celebration of the anniversary of 100 year anniversary of the addition of the 19th amendment to our constitution prohibiting any local state or federal government from denying a US citizen the ability to vote based on sex. It's easier to say that the 19th amendment gave women the right to vote. That would be less of a mouthful, but it's just not accurate. You can't give something to someone that they already inherently have. There's no external force or power or institution that can give you something that you already have. It just can't happen. All right, I gotta calm down for just a second. So I just invite you to hold that thought and we'll come back to it a little bit later. I will gather myself. In 1917, first protesters at the White House were suffragists. Over a thousand women held signs aimed at getting the attention of President Woodrow Wilson, who would tip his hat to them every morning as they held signs up. Mr. President, what will you do for women's suffrage? How long must women wait for liberty? He would tip his hat and then instruct those women to be arrested as over 300 of them were arrested in one day. Stories about suffrage in the US usually begin like this. In July, 1848, a group of people got together in Seneca Falls, New York and rallied around the demands for women's rights. But really the story begins so much earlier than that. At the end of the American Revolution and the early formation of the US government, voting rights were established. The revolutionary struggle against taxation without representation still fueled the energy of this young nation, shaking off the tyranny of King George, who refused to see the colonists as persons of worth and dignity and power. Now, as we moved into that new phase as a nation, New Jersey's original state constitution assigned voting rights to all free property owning residents and did not limit that right based on gender or race. There were women who voted, African Americans who voted in those early years, but it didn't take long for that young idealistic nation to lose its fires of liberty for all and adopt the practices of its crotchety oppressor. In 1807, New Jersey established a law that attempted to limit the power and voice of members of the population by stating that only white men had the right to vote. How did we forget so quickly the feeling of a government not respecting personhood? And that's just what it is. It's not just limiting a group of people the opportunity to take part in a political exercise. At the core of the laws established, like the one in 1807, at the very core of that law is a belief that certain persons are actually not persons after all, based on the color of their skin, their gender, their sexuality, their socioeconomic status. They do not possess the inherent worth of personhood. They do not deserve the inherent dignity of personhood. They should not be allowed the inherent power of personhood. You know, the 19th Amendment 100 years ago was not a revolutionary concept. Women voting was the original concept of liberty and justice for all. The 19th Amendment was meant to be a vaccination for the virus that often infects a person or a system that moves into its own power. A virus driven by fear and greed, attempting to limit who has the power. It's the virus of denying personhood, a virus that is just as dangerous as any virus that we are facing today. One of the early powerful voices, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, knew well this underlying disease that denying women the right to vote. I shared a little bit of her speech earlier in the opening words, and I wanted to share a little bit more of her words here. She writes, the general unrest of the subjects of kings, emperors, and czars expressed in secret plottings or open defiance against self-constituted authorities shows the subtle hatred of all people for governments to which they have not consented. But it is said that on this point, women are peculiar, that they differ from all other classes, that being dependent, they naturally prefer being governed by others. The fact of history contradict the assertion. 
these show that women have always been as far as they dared in a state of half concealed resistance to their fathers, husbands, and all self-constituted authorities. As far as good policy permitted them to manifest their real feelings, they have done so. It has taken the whole power of the civil and canon law to hold woman in that subordinate position which it is said she willingly, willingly accepts. If a woman had no will, no self-assertion, no opinions of her own to start with, what mean the terrible persecutions of this gender in the past? So persistent and merciless has been the effort to dominate the feminine element in humanity that we may well wonder at the steady resistance maintained by woman throughout the centuries. She has shown all along her love of individual freedom, her desire for self-government, while her achievements in practical affairs and her courage in the great emergencies of life have vindicated her capacity to exercise this right. Kind of makes me wish I had been in the crowd that day in Seneca Falls and listened to the powerful speech uh, given by Elizabeth Cady Stanton uh, that day. This speech came a little bit later. It's called the Ethics of Suffrage, the Suffrage Movement. And for her work, and for all of the work of Elizabeth Cady Stanton and so many people involved in the suffrage movement, the work was a spiritual endeavor. It was a battle of ethics and morality, not just politics. The work continued. Women's quest for personal worth and political power involved Americans of every race, class, and walk of life. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and Frederick Douglass formed the Equal, American Equal Rights Association with the goal of securing the right to vote for all. And of course, here in the South, Jim Crow laws worked against the 19th Amendment for men, women and African Americans. Mary McLeod Bethune is an African American female in Daytona, Florida. And in the 1920 election, despite a Ku Klux Klan rally that threatened her life, she cast her vote. The courage of Mary McLeod Bethune. Polish-born organizer Rose Schneiderman advocated for suffrage and working rights for all in the city of New York. Maria de Lopez, a Hispanic language teacher in Los Angeles, went from state to state organizing bilingual events to ensure the voting power for Spanish-speaking women. Adelina Otero Warren became the first Latina to run for Congress in 1922. Mabel Ping Huali led a parade in New York for the suffrage movement in 1912. And even though she led that parade in 1912, she was barred from American citizenship, citizenship and the vote until the Chinese Exclusion Act was repealed in 1943. Zitkala Sa, the Yankton Sioux Native American suffragists joined the fight until the Snyder Act was passed, allowing citizenship and the vote to Native Americans. We could go on and on this morning with names and stories of so many courageous women who fought the spiritual fight for personhood, claiming their worth and power that is inherent and shaking off the man-made limitations that attempt to deny that personhood. The fight for equal rights and power have made great strides in this country and at the same time, we have so much work to do. We are still a nation that has never seen a woman in the office of president or vice president and currently looks at only 26 senators out of the 100 in the Senate being female and 23% of the House being female. And that's a number that's up a lot from the last election. We have so much work still to do on top of the work that has already been done. And what a great place to do that work here at the UDC. When we understand that the limitations of power and the right to exercise the vote is an issue of personhood, then it becomes a spiritual exercise for us. As you use, we stand firmly on our values that inform personhood and justice. We stand against the practices of districting and voter oppression that attempt to subtly deny the right to vote to any of our citizens. In a few weeks, we will have an election. And choosing to register and cast your vote is more than just a willingness to participate in the political process. 
It is an exercise and practice of spirituality, bringing the flame of our chalice to the ballot box and ensuring the inherent dignity and worth of all persons when we cast our vote. It is a spiritual practice. So may we honor the courage and legacy of the women of the suffrage movement today, as well as the precious gift of our faith and our spirituality, and let our voice be heard, let our personhood be exercised, and let our vote be counted. Thank you. Anna's gonna 